What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit. This is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash malicious compliance. This story's called, You Want Me to Put It in Writing? Oh, I'll put it in writing. I just love this sub. I have a story of my own that I've been meaning to share for a while. I used to work in tech support for a large company and it was my first proper job. As such, I started as an apprentice. This story takes place about a year into my apprenticeship, so I still had much to learn. On this particular week, I was working the shift that started an hour earlier than everyone else. As in, I was so responsible for support before everyone else arrived at 9 a.m. My manager sent me on a job quite a few miles south. It was going to take two-ish days. On Monday, I informed my manager I'd be leaving Wednesday afternoon and coming back Friday afternoon and he'd need to cover my shift. It isn't my responsibility and I didn't need to say anything, but I thought I'd help him out by giving him a nudge. Mike, not real name. I'm on earlies this week, so someone will need to cover my shift Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Cheers, mate! It came to Wednesday and I suspected he hadn't arranged anything, so I thought I'd give him another nudge, genuinely trying to help the guy out. Mike, just letting you know that my early shift will need covering for the rest of this week. Oh, right you are. Thanks, pal. So off I went on the Wednesday, thinking I was doing a great job and keeping everyone in the loop. We knocked the job out of the park and finished by Thursday evening, so I head to the hotel and enjoy some sweet, sweet expenses. Friday morning, I head out in a rental they'd given me for the trip and start the journey back to the head office. I get a call from my manager. Where are you? Heading back, uh, I've just set off. I'll be back in the- I don't see anything on your calendar. I didn't put anything in it. I told- The finance director came in this morning and couldn't access the system, and you were supposed to be here for 8 a.m. I told you- Speak to me when you get back. The finance director happens to be my boss's boss's boss. Not a dude you want to piss off. And he was pissed off. Turned out his network cable had somehow came loose, kicked, and couldn't access the network. He sat stewing from 7 a.m. expecting someone to arrive by 8 a.m. to fix it, only to have no one turn up until 8.45, the head of IT, my boss's boss, who took a fair few expletives on the chin. I arrived at the office as planned, expected, and informed. Friday afternoon, my manager calls me over and gives me a lecture on the importance of communication. I tell him, I told you Wednesday I'd be back Friday afternoon and my shift would need covering. He couldn't even look at me as he says the following in the most condescending manner possible, loud enough for the head of IT to hear. I don't know, OP. I've got a pretty good memory and I do not recall that conversation. Then sends me to the head of IT who gives me a bit of a sterner lecture on the importance of communication. The word disappointed was mentioned. I go back to my desk, defeated. My victory in the South, squashed and sullied. My manager finishes the barrage. Next time, put it in the calendar and tell everyone in writing. The words ricocheted around my mind for a while until they settled and sat imprinted in my brain. I chalked this up to a learning experience and carried on. Fast forward a few months later. The words lay dormant until a bizarrely similar situation occurs. I was sent on a job for a few days and was returning once again on a Friday afternoon, and it just so happened to fall in a week when I was doing the early shift. As soon as I heard about the job, the words sprang back into life. Put it in the calendar, tell everyone in writing. Now, I could have put the details of my trip into my personal calendar, but I thought, why not enter it in the IT department's shared calendar, which the head of IT is part of. And when telling everyone in writing, surely that means everyone involved the last time. The IT department, and of course, the finance director. So, I send off an email to my manager with the IT department, and just for fun, the finance director copied in. Something like, Hi Mike, as you are already aware, I'll be working down south this week until Friday afternoon. I am on the early shift, so this will need covering while I'm away. Some of my colleagues asked me what that was about, and I informed them about my manager's memory issues. They smirk and continue working. I complete the job and arrive back Friday afternoon, exactly like before. 
And like before, the finance director came in early. And unbelievably, like before, he had issues getting onto the system. Choice expletives were shared, words were had, but not with me. I only knew Guano had hit the fan when a colleague pulled me to one side and told me why Mike was in such a foul move. In classic British style, he never said a word to me, and never has silence felt so vindicating. An obvious sign of bad leadership is letting your subordinates take the fall for you as opposed to the other way around. I've never really had to apply for a management position, so in the interview, do they quiz you? Do they like give you scenarios to see if you'd be a good manager or something? Because I feel like they should really do that. Alrighty, this story's called, If It's On The Planogram, Put It Up. I spent several years working at a big box retail store in a small midwestern town in our cellular phones department. On slow days in the afternoon before the main rush, I would help set up fixtures and displays throughout the sales floor. A lot of the store planograms or diagrams to set up product are computer generated based on the previous year's sales figures and foot traffic. For instance, say your store sold a lot of sunscreen, sunflower seeds, and condoms during the annual state football tournament. Another story for another subreddit. The computer would create a planogram or an end cap or display to show such items hoping to generate more sales. The computer would come up with wild combinations that apparently work so well that when we brought up the bizarre nature of some of the planograms to our leadership, they'd just shrug and say, if it's on a planogram, put it up. You see where I'm going with this? Now, let's set the stage. Our store neighbors a large fairground that houses one of the largest annual powwows in the world, where tens of thousands of folks from around the world come to participate. This powwow has some truly amazing shows and events from the surrounding local and regional indigenous tribes, but like any other major event, there are some bad apples. One of the go-to highs in the area is huffing cans of compressed air, and our store routinely sold out during this time. And we sometimes got yelled at for having none on the shelves, and would call other stores to see if they had any. Unfortunately, huffing, drug use, and public drunkenness became synonymous with the powwow by the non-indigenous locals rather than a great cultural exchange. The dancing ceremonies in particular are quite impressive, beautiful, and clearly take a lot of time and effort to put together. So the last year I worked at the store, it was the week of the powwow, and I got asked to help set up a computer-generated stack base, a floor palette loaded with product. The stack base consisted of disposable cameras, micro cassette tapes, and, I crap you not, cans of compressed air. Apparently, those were our largest sellers the year before. Edit. This was about 10 to 13 years ago, and camera phones were not as widely available, so I guess people used recorders to record the music on micro cassettes. Not wanting to be accused of racist corporate sponsored high pushing, I showed the planogram to my direct manager, codenamed Papa Bear, and suggested we swap out the cans of compressed air for obvious reasons. Papa Bear, not wanting to be bothered playing Chip's Challenge and Ski Free on the old manager computer in his office, sighed in annoyance and gave me the same old line. If it's all in the planogram, put it out. The computer knows best, so get it done. Papa Bear was not my favorite boss at all, as his leadership style consisted of waddling out of his office, barking orders, then waddling back like a penguin. For instance, Papa Bear loved getting on our cases for not parking in the wee back lot where employees should park, even when it's icy out, but has no problem parking his sports car in the front because leadership are no spots. In short, he earned the malicious compliance he was about to get, especially since he knew what was on the planogram and heard my specific concerns about how it would be perceived. Not wanting to lose my job and seeing a chance for malicious compliance, I smiled and said, You got it, boss! and went out to ensure his orders were followed. I was working with a coworker who will name Oscar, and he witnessed the exchange I had with Papa Bear, whom Oscar didn't like either. Oscar and I assembled the stack base with the cans of compressed air, bulk packs no less, for longer enjoyment, in the back stock room as our plan was to run it to the floor on a pallet jack, drop it off, and run. We don't want any of our customers thinking we'd assembled this, 
Scores of stock workers came by, saw what we were putting together, some of them being members of the local tribe, and expressed their shock at the level of bad taste. We showed them the planogram, explained very clearly that Papa Bear signed off on it even though we brought our concerns to him, and continued working. Once we completed the stack base, we conducted a quick bump test to ensure it would survive the hasty deployment. Safety first, wheeled it to its designated spot near the front registers, and got the hell out of Dodge. It was clearly meant for impulse buying, and the cherry on top was the signage for the pricing sign, which usually had a blurb that said something seasonally along the line of Merry Christmas or Enjoy Spring. This one said something along the lines of Enjoy Summer Events Properly. 15 minutes later, I heard a loud and surprised Whatever? from the front of the store. I could hear it clearly from my station on the other side of the building. Oscar and I looked at each other, knowing full well what was going down. On our department walkie, we heard Management to front end for customer courtesy, please, and saw Papa Bear making his way out of the back since he was the only man on duty, looking fully annoyed and probably completely unaware of the storm he was about to walk into. We could hear the shouting from the rightfully so ticked off client. Papa Bear was accused of just about everything from racism to being a corporate shill. I don't think we heard him get a single word in. We wanted to feel bad for the customer and the first employee who responded, but knowing Papa Bear was being dished a much needed punishment for not listening to his subordinates when they brought up a genuine concern was very satisfying, almost glorious. Within a minute, we saw a backroom employee take a pallet jack on the floor and wheel the stack base of shame back to the stock room to be fixed. An hour later, a co-manager, Papa Bear's right hand and an OK boss, came out and asked what happened as it was our names that assembled the stack base. We explained that we went to Papa Bear with our concerns and he told us to assemble it anyway, so we did as we were told. The co-manager nodded in agreement as he had heard the same from others who saw us assembling the stack base and expressed their concerns. Apparently, the customer filed a complaint with corporate, and so leadership was checking the cameras and everything to get a timeline of the events. The co-manager told us we did exactly as we should have by informing management of our concerns and doing our job when told to, and then walked back. That was the last Oscar and I heard of the incident, other than a new policy that computer-generated planograms had to be vetted by management first. Papa Bear kept his job, but my stories of him do not end there. Let me know if you want to hear more. First things first, cultural events are so cool. All right, no matter what culture. For instance, when I went to the Renaissance Festival, there was a lot of Polish stuff in one area, and it was really cool. But yeah, peddling drugs <laughs> at a cultural event is not very good. This story is called, Oh, you're getting scammed? I won't help you then. About two years ago, I worked for a bank, helping people over the phone. We started noticing a lot of scams going on with iTunes. People would call in, saying somebody instructed them to buy a $200 to $500 iTunes gift card for various reasons. I answer the phone one day for an entitled man, and this is how it went. Hello, thank you for calling Kernington. My name is OP, thank you for coming in, fully verified. How can I help you? Hello, yes, I need you to unlock my card to allow me to make a big purchase. May I ask what you're trying to purchase? I look through his transaction history, and I see two $500 charges that were declined, and his card was flagged for fraud. They were iTunes gift cards. Yes, uh, I'm trying to purchase two $500 gift cards. A man called me and told me I want a free trip to Disney. I'm gonna take my grandson, but I have to send him $1,000 to pay for our flights. At this point, my heart sunk. This man thought he was going to get free tickets to Disney for his grandson. But in reality, somebody was taking advantage of his naive nature. I knew I'd have to be the bad guy in telling him that it was a scam, but most people thank me for looking out for them. Sir, I'm very sorry to tell you this, but we've been receiving a lot of claims with iTunes gift cards, and that is most definitely a scam, unfortunately. But that is why we locked your card, because we're trying to prevent this from happening to other clients. The fraud department detected a scam, and we locked your card. This sends Entitled into a full meltdown. I had to turn the volume of my headset down from how loud he was screaming in a store, mind you. Listen here, you dumb bench. Unlock my freaking card now or I'll have your job by the end of the day. Don't freaking tell me what I can and cannot do with my money, you ugly cooter. 
Unlock my freaking car right now! I sat there in silence and shock. I was trying to help this man, and yet he had the nerve to say all this. I told him that if I unlock the card, there is a 30 minute processing time, and that he is responsible for whatever happens with his money, and that when this comes back as a scam, we will no longer be liable for it, and he will have to call iTunes. He agrees, and I go through the process of unlocking his card. After he hangs up, I make sure to write a lengthy note on his account about the ordeal, because I didn't want anything falling back on me. About a week later, I get a message from my a co-worker in the fraud department. He asks if I have time to talk on the phone, and I say of course. Hello, OP. I have a gentleman on the phone that had called you last week. He claims he's a victim of fraud and that you advised him to unlock his car. Can you explain to me what happened? I was furious. You can be irresponsible with your own money, but don't try to blame me for your idiotic choices, especially after I told you not to. I calmly explained to him what happened and told him that he was more than welcome to listen to the phone call. I spent five minutes on the phone with him listening to the recording. Fraud department was basically laughing. He said, thank you, you can hang up now. And I did something I technically wasn't supposed to and said, have a good day, but I muted myself. He gets back online with Entitled. Hello, sir? Yeah? What did she say? That was my fault? You need to fire her and get a more truthful employee. I won't stand for this. I want my money back. Actually, sir, I reviewed the recording of the phone call and you gave full consent to unlocking your car, even against my coworker advising you not to. We are not liable for this as she stated in the call with you. If you wish to call iTunes, feel free. Have a nice day. Entitled starts screaming into the phone as fraud department hung up. Because I was still on the line, I could hear him screaming into the phone as I sat there giggling to myself. I knew iTunes wouldn't give him any money, as I've seen it happen before with prior cases. Thank God I recorded that note. Maybe that will teach him a lesson on being nice to people trying to help him. Ah, uh, you know what they say. I mean, I don't, but you guys probably do. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.